Through the Noise with your host, Ernesto Glucksman. Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. Um, we just did the little pre, pre-mic powwow, but <laughs> the reality is we should just probably push record and just start talking to each other. Sure. Um, thanks for coming on the show. I'm so excited to get a chance to talk to you. I've been uh, a, a fan of your newsletter and your YouTube channel for quite some time. Uh, you have the Jonathan Stark Show, and then you're also on another podcast, um, The Business of Authority, with uh, your co-host there, Rochelle Moulton, right? Did I pronounce her last yep. name right? Uh, yep, Rochelle Moulton, yep. Yeah, and um, I, you know, one of the things that drew me to you was the conversation of pricing and the pricing strategies. I think mm-hmm. you're a big promoter of billing hourly billing is doesn't have the right incentives for anybody and yes when you dig into it you do realize yeah even if you well let's talk about let's start there give us your general sense of why pricing per hour doesn't really work in this world Um, yeah well let's start let's start with uh first that it's not a price really it's a rate so Mm -hmm. when a client comes along and says hey Uh, I want you to do whatever it is that you do, whether it's coaching or video production or software development. Uh, They say, hey, we need some of that. And we'd like to know what your hourly rate is because we're looking for someone to do that stuff for us. And then you say $100 an hour or $200 an hour or whatever. And you maybe have a, a chat with them and you come up with maybe an idea of what the scope would be for you to do that thing for them or how those activities for them that they want you to do. And then you'd give them an estimate. I think it'll be $10,000. Maybe, maybe not. And it feels like a price to you and they feel like it's a price and they have to treat it like a price. And if you're great at doing estimates and you can keep it in that range, then fine. Then it tends to work out um, and everybody's happy. But in my experience, at least from the software space, it was fairly rare for it to stay in scope and for uh, for the estimate to be turned into the actual. And it would often go way overboard and it was driving me crazy. It seemed like no matter how much I would tack on hours in my mind before a project, the fish always grew to fill the fishbowl and then we still had work to do after. Mm -hmm. It was driving me crazy. And uh, I sort of had this epiphany moment at one point where I was like, we get, it's hourly billing is the problem here. And, and the problem that I was trying to solve was I wanted my customers to be happier. I wanted to satisfy them. I wanted to be able to, uh, deliver what they wanted at the price that they expected. And it, it, the hourly billing was the the cause of the problem. It was the root cause because there was no incentive to go faster. There was no incentive to build tools and make myself more efficient or my team more efficient. Uh, so I switched off of that, switched over to fixed pricing based on value. Uh, for a long time, I did that and it was extremely profitable and it was just transformative on the client relationship. Uh, So a huge, huge fan of that. Uh, But value pricing is a huge mind shift for people. It can be very difficult to, it takes some practice. It can be difficult to just switch to, uh, especially if you have a firm that has a lot of systems that are based on hours and all of your incentives are based on hours and your clients are expecting you to build them for hours. Uh, You have to change basically everything. So it's a big shift. Uh, So I've come up with all other ways to set prices instead of giving rates and estimates and that sort of thing, which allows you to create customer satisfaction, which is a wonderful thing because then they come back for more, they refer you to other people and you can grow your business uh, instead of just watching the clock all the time and hoping with your fingers crossed that everybody will end up happy. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, um, on the, um, the, the, the pricing, the rate per hour, I mean, there's just a natural, um, image issue. Like if, if you're, you know, if you have a set of hours or you're charging per the hour, what's your incentive to go faster? Cause if you go faster then I mean, if you solve the problem faster then you, um, basically cut out time that you could be paid for. Right. Yeah. And even if you're an honest broker and you, and you're just too busy, like, I mean, we're, we're, oftentimes we're just, developers and they're just you're just trying to if you can solve something quickly you're going to solve it quickly because there's just harder problems to work on mm-hmm. um but the perception is still there right because the mm-hmm. customer paid you by the hour they want to know why it took you 15 minutes to write 
an email to me or an hour for that other email, right? Mm -hmm. Well, because it took more time to think through the nuance and the expectations that you were, you know, you're trying to explain technical issues. And so mm -hmm. you can't get away from the, the perception of the questionable per hour issue, right? Mm -hmm. And for the, for the customer, they want you to go faster because it means they don't have to pay you as much. Mm -hmm. But then they want the quality or the well thought out or the well understood, you know, understanding them. And that in and of itself just takes time mm -hmm. to do, right? To be in their space and really come up with course correcting advice, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many problems with it. Like the, the, the simple fact is you're putting an artificial limit on your income. You've only got so many hours in the year. So why would you limit yourself to that? I mean, that's sort of a sort of a self-interested way to look at it. But, you know, you're not billing, probably you're not billing 40 hours a week and your hourly rate is probably not $200 an hour or higher. It's pretty rare. Depends on the industry, of course. But most people I talk to, the average is about $100 an hour, maybe some $50 an hour, some $150 an hour. A couple of high-end developers I know do two, $250 an hour. You know, and if you're a partner at a, a law firm in New York City, maybe it's five hundred dollars an hour, a thousand, whatever. It's not the point. Your 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 clients don't want your time; they want an outcome. And if you can deliver that outcome more quickly, you should be rewarded for it, not punished for it. The better you get at your job, the more you are punished by hourly billing. And you, theoretically, you could raise your rate, but if you if you raise your rate significantly higher than other people who appear to do the same thing that you do, it's going to be really hard to close deals. So if you come, you know, if, if the going rate for a WordPress developer is $75 an hour and you charge 300, good mm. luck. You know, how are you going to demonstrate the value to somebody who is probably just trying to get a WordPress site together and has no idea how long or how complicated those things can get. Right. So they're, right. you know, um, all they're going to do is look at then the price point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives it gives clients or prospects an artificial apples to apples comparison between you and anybody else. So it, it creates all kinds of marketing problems, all kinds of differentiation problems. It creates obviously the pricing problems and the customer satisfaction problems. It's terrible. It is really bad. I mean, I go so far as to say that it's a cancer on professional services because it eats your your firm alive from the inside. It's just like it's terrible. And, but I understand that it's a big shift and that it's the, the normal way. So it's what clients expect and so on and so forth. But clients are actually, in general, good. any good client is going to be very open to the idea of a fixed price that you stand behind because who wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. That's how you buy virtually everything. Virtually everything you buy, you see the price tag, you see the thing, you know what the, the benefit of the thing is going to be, and you decide if it's worth it to you or not. And then you hand over your money and now you have the thing. And even in a service context, if you're focusing on the benefit that the client is going to get out of the engagement, then they, they will have, that'll be worth something to them. And you can put a price tag on that and they'll be either happy with it or not happy with it, but probably they'll be happy with it if you do a good job estimating what it's worth to them. And then you figure out how to keep the scope underneath the price that you set. And you get to decide how to do your job and you get to benefit from efficiencies and expertise and optimization and all of the tools that you built for yourself to make your job easier. And if you can finish a $50,000 project in a weekend, the client's going to be just as happy as they would be if it took you six months. They'll be happier and your profitability is way higher. They're pro they're, uh, they're, I mean, they get a profit from it too. That's, it might not be direct cash profit, but it's a, a an ROI where if they paid $50,000 for something that's worth a million to them, then that's a huge profit for them. So it's a win all the way around. The, right. The tricky it has part, to be attached to the outcomes, right? I mean, it's yeah. not the 50,000, it's like the 50,000 solving this particular outcome in our business challenge, whatever mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. presumably it's like a tenfold or more mm -hmm. return for them. And then they'll just, they would, they would keep doing it if they could, right? If right. they could get $500,000 in return, <laughs> of business value for a 50k investment you just keep, you keep yeah take my money it, right. right yeah and and it's it, it's i i recognize that it's a hard shift i have like entire books and entire coaching programs on how to make that transition it's uh, it was easy for me because i just started fresh i you know i was at a firm i was the vice president i was 
just uh, had to obsess about hours all the time. It was my whole life was hours. Mm -hmm. And I finally, I was like, oh, hours is the problem. So let's switch to uh, a value-based project style. And it was like the, the owner was like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I don't know how we would do that. So I was like, yeah, but, and he was right. I didn't really know how to do it either. It was a very theoretical concept for me at the time, but it was clearly right. I was, I knew it was right, but I didn't know how to put it into practice. So I went solo and I put it into practice with only my neck on the line. And it was, it just was amazing. In the very first year, I was just like, oh, wow, this is dramatically better all the way around. Yeah. The, um, the, you know, let's, dive back to the zone. I mean, you and I have both been web developers or our backgrounds have come from the old school web development. Yes. And, you know, we know that like when you show a client, if you're working in communications, let's say, and mm -hmm. you're showing whoever your stakeholders are, um, a communication website style information, like the first draft of it, you know, you could call it done, but most likely what will happen is it'll stimulate another set of ideas like you know you have a in other words in technology development you have a vision you price against what that vision the scope of that vision roughly is but invariably when you start to present the material to the client or to whoever they're naturally are going to create new ideas based on what you're showing them they'll think of a better way of explaining what they want the home page to really really look like mm -hmm. and so if you were on an hourly basis and that kind of thing. Okay, well you keep getting hourlies, but the clients feels like suddenly you're just not doing it the right way or you're not doing it. I'm telling you too, like you're not getting my vision. It's like, yeah. yes, client, I can't read your mind. I can't, and you keep moving these quote unquote goalposts, right? Yeah. If you price it just on an estimate, you know, or a fixed fee, I mean, you still run into that, right? Um, not like, really. Okay. No. So how do because, you how do you manage that? Well, there's you, clients don't change their desired business outcome very often. Okay. Go so if you outcome. yes, if you focus on the outcome of the web page in the first place, and you before you even write a proposal, you figure out you basically gain the confidence that they have a clear desired outcome. It, there there are the goalposts. There they are. The goalpost isn't oh we want a pretty homepage. It needs to be something that is defined in business value. It doesn't have to be bottom line value. It has to be uh, some kind of goal, even if it's way upstream that they have that they can measure that is going to, they believe, improve the bottom line or the top line or something. So if you say to someone, if someone comes along and says, Hey, you, you're good at WordPress websites. We have a WordPress website and we need you to work on our WordPress website, or we're looking for someone to work on it. What's your hourly rate? I would say, well, I don't have an hourly rate. I can give you a price for the project if if I agree that we'd be a good fit. Would it be okay to just talk about the project and then I could perhaps give you a proposal with a fixed price? And most people are gonna say yes, not everyone. Uh, sometimes you're talking to a gatekeeper or someone who's just been tasked with finding a WordPress developer and they're not, they're gonna be like, ah, I don't know, I'm just supposed to be getting hourly rates. So that, you know, you can try and get past the gatekeeper uh, or it might be an organization that it has regulatory reasons why they have to only work with people who bill by the hour. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that might not be a good fit. But assuming you're talking to someone who has actual budgetary control or is in direct contact with someone who is, you get on a conversation with them and you say, you have what I call the why conversation, and you're familiar with Alan Weiss, it's going to sound familiar. You just ask them, why do this? Why do this now? And why would you hire someone expensive like me to do it? Why not do it yourself? Why not have an intern do it? Don't you have any web developers on staff? Have them do it. And you just sort of get all of the objection, objections on the table and figure out, you know, the, the first one, why this? Why would they bother doing something like investing time and money in this? What return do they think they're going to get out of it? So eventually they're going to either give you whatever the underlying motivation is or what the, what the transformation is that they're looking for. But you really need to find out what their current state is. That's pretty easy and then figure out what their desired future state is. And there'll be a gap between those two things. And they'll know that they're not at the future state because they're measuring something. It might be a gut instinct. It might be intangible. It might be subjective, but they are measuring it. It's the reason they're talking to you. Something's wrong, or there's an opportunity that they're not capturing, or they would not be talking to you. 
So if you determine what that is, and then you agree with their assessment that someone like you could help, then you start figuring out, um, you know, why they would hire someone expensive like you instead of all the other cheaper options. Why not just go to Fiverr or TopTal or Upwork? Why not just do that? Why not hire an intern or your cousin Vinny? Why not do that? And they'll give you reasons. And then you say, okay, these are good reasons. This transform for a company like this, this transformation has got to be worth at least $100,000 per year. I'm highly confident that I can help them reach this goal. So I'm going to give them a proposal with three prices that are less than what I think the value is to this buyer. I would usually go, you know, if, if I thought, and it's, you know, it's more art than science, but if I thought the benefit to them or the, what it was worth to them was kind of like $100,000 a year, then I'd just give them three prices, 10000 22000 and 50000 And then I would decide what I was going to do inside of that scope to help. Yeah. What, what could I, if somebody gave me $10,000, how could I help this client move the needle on this transformation that they want? Think about the scope last instead of what people usually do, which is think of the scope first and they try and get all the information out of the client that they can and they never get it all because it's just a short meeting with a non-expert, you know, mm. telling you what to do in your web development work or whatever you do. So the wrong person is driving the car and they're, you know, they got to tell you everything. And then how many times have people probably had the conversation late into a project when it's already over budget and you're 90% done and you got 90% to go and you get into finger pointing. Well, you didn't tell me we were going to have to do a hundred revisions of the homepage. It's like, that's not the point. The client shouldn't be telling you how to do your job or how many revisions of the homepage need to be done. That's why they hired an expert. You will tell them what their homepage needs to look like to achieve the transformation that they want. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to change that transformation very frequently unless they're, you know, a bad client. That, that exactly. So, the, oh man, and honestly, I have to, if anybody's listening to this, that's not that familiar with what your the value pricing kind of concepts, then it's your show is going to have just a plethora of it that breaks down into those digestible pieces, right? Because every oh, yeah. piece of this concept is something you have to really kind of think through. Um, but it comes back to achieving going through the outcomes of what the organization is trying to to get mm -hmm. we did um a significant project for a kind of an academic uh association and it involved not just creating a new website but it was also kind of a cost reduction they had a website and their association management system in the sy same system and it was kind of it was old school. It did, it does this, the, the software system did pretty good on the association management, but on the front end of it all, it just never worked because they'll never be able to compete with like WordPress, who's a market dominating platform, right? As an example. And so they had some pretty pricey consultants that were being asked to, can you put up this list of bullet points and we'll pay you $200 an hour, $300, whatever it was to do it. And of course the, consultant was more than happy to do that high priced content updating. So anyway, the thing is the way we structured the arrangement was we had to reduce the outcome was, can we reshift some of that consultant fees towards the database part of it, not the website part of it mm -hmm. by putting up this system. We didn't get into like what specifics would be needed of the website. We just, it's assumed that we're going to, do what's necessary it's right. the outcomes that they cared about and really mm -hmm. we're only like when i went through it with them really only like four or five major outcomes and they were happy to write that giant check because they they were they knew that that cost, a, less than a year from now mm -hmm. they would see a significant cost reductions overall in other words they were paying me to save a bunch of money that they were already out you know spending somewhere else yeah um and that yeah, was that's the, the yeah. This, um, I, Jonathan, I want to kind of like shift gears a little bit into the into this other zone, um, with with the nonprofits and listeners that um, it, you know, I've me I've mentioned podcasting probably a bit too much over the years, uh, <laughs> but I'm a big believer that like I have been for over like at least seven or six years. I mean, through the noise itself has been transformational for my business and. Mm -hmm. I've seen it help with, in, especially in the association space. Um, it, it's easy to sort of see practitioners, consultants, be, you know, begin their channels, and especially in this kind of 
uh, time that we're all stuck on using Zoom and these kinds of tools anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but from an association space, it's like the obvious things were there. You have uh, an authority on a particular industry or society. You have an, a baked in audience, presumably your members. And then you have like strategic desires to achieve, you know, getting public understanding of the complexity of the industry and so forth. So why weren't they all starting podcasts because it just right. seemed like that's a good, this was a good way to share in a more transparent manner the work that they do. And well, the answer to that is that it's just, everything is harder <laughs> in, in a multi-stakeholder environment. But can you maybe just talk a little bit about, you, you know, what it's done for you and mm -hmm. your business? Sure. Um, and then we'll go into specifics on, for these nonprofits. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's something magical about podcasting and I suppose it would be true with radio and TV and all of those uh, sorts of media, but podcasting is so cheap and easy and free and accessible to everyone. And uh, in terms of bang for the buck, it's hard to think of a better way to build trust with an audience. And if you're in the business of selling some kind of expertise, you've got an expertise based business, you're a specialist at something. It's no brainer. It's a no brainer. I mean, it is, a, it will be a massive differentiator for you. Um, and it, it, like I said, it just, it, you know, attracting an audience is one thing, but once the people who are listeners, they will trust you. It's, you almost are like a rock star to them when they do finally talk to you, which makes your job a lot easier. And you can actually be more effective and more valuable because you already have the trust thing out of the way. So, I mean, it's, it's, everybody should have a podcast pretty much. Like if you're, if you run that kind of a business, you're kind of crazy not to have it because it doesn't have to be difficult. If you're capable of handling a zoom call, you're definitely capable of starting a podcast. I just yeah. did a, a five day podcast challenge with a whole bunch of people. And now there's like 10 new podcasts in the world. You know, it's, it's does not have to be hard. It can seem really complicated if you Google around and like, Oh, what kind of mic should I use? And what should I do in my room? What software should I use? And how do I edit and that, 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 and all of that stuff's cool and it's good to learn and you can make it sound a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. But the way that you're going to actually do a great podcast is by starting a mediocre podcast and getting better at it over time. Everybody, everybody who has been podcasting, if you go back and listen to your early episodes, it's I, like, cringe. don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. If it's uncomfortable because you're, you, but that's how you get better. You start oh, right. doing it. And it's really easy to get paralyzed. It's, you know, whether it's organizational decisions about what, you know, what's going to be said, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And that's, that's a different can of worms, I think. But putting together a podcast that's good enough to help the audience is transformative for your business. Yeah, the, um, the, I would say the challenge for many um, different types of nonprofits, but it's, it's to show the relevancy, the reason they even exist, um, mm -hmm. especially when they, their members are all giant groups or, you know, or, or large societies. I mean, it's, it's always going to be a challenge for staff inside these organizations to kind of come up with new innovative initiatives if they don't have some buy-in from stakeholders there's got to be it's got to be member driven society driven mm -hmm. in some ways but it's if you're not asking if anybody's interested then no one's going to really tell you out of the box either um i mean the latest statistics on podcast listenership it's over a quarter of americans are active podcast listeners so basically one in four you would say of your mailing list are active podcast listeners if why would they not listen to the podcast that comes from the society or association that they're a member of that speaks directly to their career, their wallets? I mean, I think mm -hmm. that that's the edge to it. Um, and, you know, over time, I've been sort of running around Washington, D.C., expressing this, inviting folks on my own show and learning about that. And over time, it's, you know, it's, or these organizations have come around. And right now, <laughs> they're those that have been more event based getting people together obviously you can't do that mm -hmm. and so they're figuring out the zoom scenarios but if you're doing a, a zoom webinar then there you go you have all the raw materials to then publish the podcast right and push out into another channel um the one area that i've noticed that it's still kind of a difficult area is 
all right, well, how do you fund it? Or how do you, how do you, you know, help the association also get a return for the effort? And mm. every one of them is very different. But one of the things that I had noticed was, especially for those that have gotten through the first year of doing their show, they start realizing, oh, this is actually a powerful way to stay in touch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's, it, it's, it's, it's not just another uh, newsletter or press release that you're hoping everybody takes the time out of work to listen to. Yeah. It's actually conversational. You can put mm-hmm. this in the background, all, all the good things, all the intangibles that are packaged in there. Mm-hmm. But then when it comes to like, okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll open it up for somebody, one of the, you know, ancillary members to sponsor. And I'll give you an example um, in the retail, I did one of the first sponsors we got was, um, well, actually before we get there, what I'm no- what I had noticed was they would say, okay, they treat it like a, like getting an ad in their monthly magazine or an ad in their newsletter. They'll sort mm-hmm. of like transact it on like, all right, well, the price is, let's say a grand and it, you'll have a little ad or a little, this podcast is supported by such and such group. Mm-hmm. And, I can't help but feel that that's a missed opportunity because it, it makes it so back to the transactional. I mean, we're not doing it by the hour, but it's like, whatever it's by the pot, by the episode or by the month. Why did, why pick that in any, you know, for any, any particular reason, you know, like the, mm. um, I, and I, it's just, it's just part of the way they're used to it in some cases, the group that we did in the retail feder, the national retail federation, they had, um, they were a little bit more bolder and they just simply said, Hey, we are looking for somebody to help us with this initiative. They didn't, they didn't come up with a pricing or anything. And just as the example of a value based pricing model that is out there for associations, um, PW prize waterhouse Cooper instantly picked that one up and they said, mm-hmm. yes, we want it. And Oh, by the way, we want it to be exclusive and here's a hundred K. Mm-hmm. Well, that covered the price <laughs> of the whole production. And my client, without checking in with me, they said, absolutely, sure. <laughs> they took the cash. And it just kind of had dawned on me, you know, you probably left money on the table there as well because you could have had two presenting sponsors or <laughs> a presenting sponsor and, you know, a couple of special episodes. Anyway, it didn't matter. They made a compelling offer and it was brilliant by PwC because they wanted to sort of show the value to PwC is to show that they are a big supporter of this federation and they didn't want anybody else to take that spot like mm-hmm. Accenture or whoever else. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the, it, it, they, they fell into the value based pricing simply because they didn't really, you know, determine it, a determine a per episode or per monthly fee. Mm. Um, is yeah. I mean, I don't think everything has to be value priced. Um, if the, I mean, I would actually to back up to some of the things you mentioned earlier, um, about why would, you know, it's the association is, uh, the motivation for releasing the podcast. You said something like that they're trying to justify their existence sort of. Well, you know, they're like, relevant, being relevant in a space where there's so many options to gather in other groups or in many cases with, you know, why, join an association with your competitors if you already have a a lobbyist representing your needs on the hill for example Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um and there's there that's the this the internal discussions of many associations like how do we stay relevant in ever growing more options how do we stay connected how do we keep it can't just be the annual party that we get together there's got to be more all the time right right right. to justify those dues so i i I think whenever you're starting a podcast or even thinking about a blog or writing a book or whatever the content is that you're going to create, it has to start off with who is this for and why should they care? Like what's in it for them? If you're going to listen to me for 20 minutes, what's in it? What's in it for you? What's in it for the listener? And as a side effect, you'd get those other things that you mentioned. I think leading with those and saying, we need to start a podcast so we can keep charging people money or make ourselves seem worthwhile is a little bit backwards if sure. you just trust that it's going to be you trust that you're going to find a way to fund it and start with how can we help the people that we want to listen then it's going to automatically if you can answer that question then you're automatically going to have a show that people want to listen to you know it's kind of like you know like 
if the show's just a bunch of you doing dramatic readings of your press releases, then no one is going to listen. <laughs> but if it's, if it's, you know, if you're bringing people on who are wrestling with problems and members that are wrestling with problems and something that your organization does makes those problems go away or alleviates them or helps them capture some opportunity, you're just demonstrating value. Then people are going to want to there's value there for them. There's going to be something interesting to them. So I, any, anything that somebody creates when I'm coaching people, if they're going to create a PDF or a podcast or write a book, my first question is, who is it for? Hmm. It's not for everyone. Who is it for? And then what are they going to get out of it? If they invest the money or the time in consuming this content, listening, watching, reading, what is the promise to them? What is the pain that it solves? Like you want to answer that question, that what's in it for me question that every buyer or, you know, listener or reader is going to have in their heads. What's in it for me? Why should I care? And if you can't answer that, then it's not going to work. So, you know, you're just going to be pushing a rock uphill. But if you can't answer that question and then effectively deliver on that promise week after week or day after day or whatever it is, whatever the frequency is, you're going to, it's going to, people are going to come back. They're going to tell other people, your audience is going to grow. They're going to trust you more. They're going to be getting value from you for free and or you know whatever if people are paying and sponsoring um and it's go if if you believe that a content strategy is going to further your goals as an organization then some of the some of the questions that you said that these places associations would wrestle with early on it's kind of like an overall content question what do we want to say mm -hmm. um whether or not to do it on a podcast is a tactical decision i think you know for, for solo people for solo consultants and experts of whatever stripe i think podcast is like a no-brainer for sure for an association it's probably a no-brainer i don't work with associations so i don't really know but um the questions that you had that you said would stall out associations or it's a it's not a question about a podcast it's a question about what's our content strategy overall yeah. and once you have that then releasing it as a podcast probably makes a lot of sense yeah i mean in the uh, it's exactly that it's exactly like what is it actually that we're going to say and reflect upon it with our both our our inherent audience which is our members mm -hmm. and then the external it's everybody else who's not maybe quite a member yet but is interested in what the industry and i'll give you a clear example of that one uh show we did for uh, national association convenience stores um you know they 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 would they would always interview interesting business owners if the, all kinds of you know all the, the the varied uh membership that they've had what's working over there what's working over here and through some of that sort of technique sharing across convenience stores um that you know it built for it built a community but then you quickly learn there's two areas that really interest them is when joe sheets who happens to be uh the owner of the sheets empire which is like 10,000 employees and they, they they have such a huge footprint that whenever that guy spoke on the show everybody listened because they're trying you realize they're trying to read between the lines what is Joe paying attention to because he must know consumer sentiment even better than I do and what can I learn to become a successful person this is an authority like they the association has access to those types of folks has mm -hmm. the type of expertise internally to ask the right questions that would interest because they're there listening to all the members all the time complaining right. about this or that right <laughs> so they know what to ask and the other angle to that was all the trend reporting that is heavily invested and it takes a lot of effort and collective collection and deciphering and distilling that's another role associations play that information is also important because it just goes back to speaks to their wallets if you listen to the show if you're maybe a junior member at a large company the big boss gets to go to the annual event but you you're not quite there yet but you want to sound like you know what you're talking about mm -hmm. well you if there was a podcast from the association you better believe they would be especially the ambitious ones would be listening to it <laughs> yeah. right and so how much is that worth getting in front of the ambitious future leaders getting in getting seen by your community of peers how much is that worth to the suppliers of that industry to have um, their banners actively supporting this in some mm -hmm. way? It could be immeasurable, right? In some ways. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't need to be an expensive, it's not, it's kind of like saying how much is marketing worth? You know, it's, it depends on the person you're asking. So mm -hmm. if the, if the association 
is investing money in marketing and they've got alignment on a content strategy and they're all kind of rowing in the same direction. Kind of crazy not to have a podcast because you've done all the hard parts and the cost to run a podcast is like virtually free. It's comically low. So, you know, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to sound like NPR. It doesn't have to be this big produced no. thing. You know, it can fact, be, you might not want that. You want right. More raw, almost, like I'm a real person here, not, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it, it, I'm just, it's just kind of crazy not to do it and to worry about the cost of it is, um, to me would kind of reveal a misunderstanding of what the costs are because it's, it, it's seriously, it's almost free, you know, and if you you're probably an association, they're going to pay someone to edit it. But I mean, compared to probably uh, compared to, I'm sure membership fees or any other marketing spend they're doing, it's going to be a drop in the bucket. So why not do it? If you have someone who's excited about doing it, you know, they probably need some kind of a host and, you know, pick someone to do that. But, you know, it should be fun and helpful and useful and cheap and easy and <laughs> there's mm -hmm. really there's really not a lot to it yeah i there's you know there's another subset of folks that listen to this show that are consultants that work with these associations and um and it's you know it's a it's a it's a challenging space to be in it's a small space you basically have to participate with the american society of there's an association for association executives of course <laughs> asa so meta and it is meta and they're the big they're the big uh the big whale in the space they're they're very helpful but also they have to manage a, a lot of varying interests so sometimes vendors and consultants don't feel like they get their the due or their attention for what they do for the community blah blah blah, blah. all that mm -hmm. all that aside is if you're listening on my show because you're you're hearing me talk to some of these executive directors and you're trying to figure out like what's you know reading between the lines there i mean i think you should probably do 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 your own show as well because that's a good way to just discuss the topics that are in your mind right like i, I think jonathan with you you i mean you're you're solo right you're mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and you put out nearly a daily newsletter i feel it's, like I get... yeah i've been a daily newsletter since 2016 i've sent out about 1500 in a row that's so that's so intense. Um, and then, <laughs> in my opinion, but you also put out what a weekly of the show. How often do you push? Yeah, we've got a, I've got a weekly podcast called The Business of Authority. I have another one that is uh, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, called Ditching Hourly. And yeah. I, I do tech. I have a tech podcast. I've been podcasting since I don't know two thousand and five. I think so. I've I've done over a thousand episodes. I've guest on you know hun oops hundreds of shows like this. And yeah, it's, it's not hard. It, it's not hard at all. You and don't have to, it doesn't have to be hard. It can be complicated and time consuming, but it doesn't need to be. Right. And I think that part of it is just a, a, just a daily practice of honing your own craft of being able to explain this kind of the value pricing concept, which is not that easy to kind of no. get over the hump. But once you do, you realize, Oh, like, aha, this, it, it just aligns better. But mm -hmm. what I've noticed over time with you is, Every time you do write something, it's not like um, it's the same theme. Yep. It's not the same topic within that theme. And in right. fact, you keep getting better at describing different aspects that all feed into mm -hmm. how to do this well and excel at this process where basically at the end of the day, you're getting paid a high fee and you're delivering a much higher value to the customer and the customer is going to be like, thank you for taking my money because <laughs> right. it worked. It just, it, the, the, the out, outcomes based, you know, uh, and, and, and feed, like, that's where the focus should be in any business conversation, right? If I yeah. do this for you, how are you going to make money off of this? Right. right. What you, are you trying to achieve? Yes. Right. Um, and yeah. And you, I, the content thing, since we're talking about podcasts, you described it well, actually, because in my mind, um, I, I call it a, like a solar system. It's like a content solar system where I've got this central theme, which I view as the sun. And then it's got this gravitational pull of planets around it. And each planet is a different topic, but they stay together instead of flying apart. They stay held together by the central theme, which for me is increasing your profitability, ditching hourly. So ditch hourly. That's my central theme. And if I, and then planets that revolve around that can be as diverse as how to write a proposal, how to start a podcast, uh, how to write a book proposal, 
uh, how to do, I don't know, uh, Facebook ads. You know, there's a million topics around uh, building a business that is not going to be selling yourself, you know, renting your life away one hour at a time and instead building a business that's going to increase in profitability for you and your clients and have a bigger impact on the world. Lots of different topics, but without that central theme, they would just fly apart and it wouldn't create a body of work over time uh, that was cohesive. But, you know, how can I write 1500 emails that when you read back through them, they all kind of make sense, even though they're about 10 different topics, because I always like filter it back or through the through the filter of pricing so it, it kind of holds everything together even though it seems like it, i mean i am talking about different things but there's a sort of a method to the madness that underlies the uh, all of that output you, you know it's funny you mentioned this because um how, i'm curious to know how you pick the ditching hourly piece of it because it could have just as easily been give escalating options like yeah, to me that was revolutionary in its in its concept like mm -hmm. okay you 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 agree to a certain scope and size that's your most economical option here's what i will do for you and yep. what you'll get and what the outcome and oh by the way here's three others that escalate you would get that and this if you gave us a little more and so forth mm -hmm. and um i'm sure i'm not i don't have to tell this to you jonathan but <laughs> It's like everybody I talk to just still does the one price. Well, what do you want to do? Okay, yeah. this is what I'll do. Here's the one price. And then it's a yes or no. It's an ultimatum. Yeah. Vote, right? And, um, and so I, when, I, and when I, I, have, I have like a group I get together with some young um, kind of agency guys, and that's one of the first things that always comes up. It's like, well, have you, do, you, do you guys give like options for your price? Like I always go there versus mm – -hmm the ditching hourly components, like <laughs> starting there, like you guys should really think about this yeah. hourly pricing thing. Um, yeah. How right, did you, how yeah, did you I, pick on that? Yeah. Right. I could have taken any of the planets and made that the center. It, the, the one that I ended up picking was really the one that uh, to me is my favorite piece of it. Got so it. to me, the, the favorite piece is this, that shift, which just goes back to my epiphany from 2005 when I recognized this, what I saw is what, what I immediately saw is like, oh, wow, here's a fundamental problem that's staring everybody in this space, staring them in the face, and no one is seeing it. Or not no one, but practically no one. And, you know, I was able to find a number of people, Alan Weiss, uh, Ron Baker, Ed Kless, um, uh, Michael Port. There are a bunch of people who knew about this. It's not a new concept. Uh, it just is not popular. And I think that's a shame. So anyway, that's the, that's the central theme that I chose. It's just my favorite. That's all. That's so all you, you could be. pick any of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so who do you, you know, probably wrap this up, but who do you, who are you, who do you derive inspiration? I know that one of your episodes, you, you picked that, you grabbed one of Alan Weiss's books. And by the way, that's, he's a prolific writer right there in that universe. Mm -hmm. And it's very like, um, I think you even described it as kind of baller, a little too, <laughs> over but it's just clear it's clear writing like he really he's a great writer he, yes he, gr he grinds it into the to the stone that if you're thinking of doing business in any other way it's and there's lots of models there's lots of business mm. models out there but fundamentally for consulting advising in vague with when there's vague um scope definition but you have very specific outcomes Mm -hmm. Hourly is not the way to do it. Really, right. it's not going to make. It's not going to lead to anybody being too happy about probably not the situation, yes. right? Yeah. Um, how, how, who who do you listen to now? Who do you who do you draw inspiration from? Yeah, I the value pricing thing for me is is really just one of the planets in my solar system, and it's uh, you know he, Weiss is just a genius on the subject. Really smart guy, great writer. Um, Ron Baker is another one who's written a bunch of really good things about it. Um, if for folks who are a little bit more in the creative space or the ad space, uh, I'd recommend Blair N's Price and Creativity. Mm. Um, there's, there's, you know, there are some people out there that are fighting the good fight. Um, but I don't really, I feel like I've kind of, I've kind of like, you know, the S curve, I've sort of like reached the top of the S curve on the value pricing thing. Um, so I don't really read anything about it. It's like, I, my, I got it. Like, I get it now. Um, I'm more, uh, into like Seth Godin style stuff now or okay. Derek Sivers or, you know, something that's a little bit more, uh, big picture. Cause in the, in my coaching, it's not the, the stickier problems 
for certain people, not all people. The stickier problems are things like motivation and how do I, how do I know what to pick? How do I know what I like? You know, how do I know how I want to spend the next 10 years of my life? And those questions get a lot more um, leadershipy and strategic and uh, almost psychological. So those are the those are the things I'm really focused on now. Is like how to how to maintain um, creativity, how to find your purpose, those sorts of things, which are way outside of my comfort zone or have been. So you know, following people like Seth Godin, for example, you know, we interviewed him on the Business of Authority uh, a few episodes back, and it's it's. Um, it's eye-opening, you know, to when, when, when you see people coming up against these problems, value pricing seems almost trivial in comparison to like, I don't know why I get out of bed in the morning, you know, it's almost right. like, Oof. yeah, right. it's like, well, you know, or I only like, my only goal is a, a financial amount of money in my bank account. It's like, well, is that really your goal? You know, so things, things that help me drill into what really motivates people and how to get them taking action in a direction. So getting people moving in a forward direction, that is the kind of stuff that I'm, that I am focused on getting better at right now. So I'm somewhere in the middle of the S curve on that one. I see. Cause it's just the type, the, the discussions that you have with your, with the, with your client base where you might, you just feel like you're maybe some of those folks, not quite you're trying to figure out a better way to advise them on how to, is this the zone for them or not? Right. Cause it, that gets to the core of like who you are, mm -hmm. what skills you have, what, the, yeah. and then all of then you got to, what you think the marketplace is willing to pay or who's got the, the challenges really, I think at the end of the day, it's just a lifelong trial and error process to figure out really who you are and what you truly enjoy doing. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. So the things that for me, it's not about understanding the core concepts. Now okay. it's about finding ways to communicate them in a way that will help someone take action. So like I can, you know, you could just buy my book and you're going to know what I think, gotcha. but is that going to get you off your butt? Probably not. It might for some people it will, but for a lot of people it's not going to, or they're going to have a, a tough time connecting the dots or they're going to find like, Oh, you know, they're going to find like imposter syndrome haunting them or the resistance like Stephen Pressfield talks about, or mm, that's um, a great book. Oh, it's great. so good. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Stephen Pressfield's another good one. Dan Pink's another good one. Uh, Dan Ariely. These, they're all, I mean, like getting, uh, who, who's the other guy that start with why guy, you know, that, that stuff is, it sounds, it can sound real hand wavy and like BS, but once you start working with people who are hitting these exact problems, you're like, wow, that's not BS. Like, and, and yeah, you can, real. yeah, it's very real. And you know, once it's, it's realer with people who kind of have their financial thing squared away, you know, they're not struggling for, you know, they, maybe they'd be happy if they were broken through to the next level or something, but they're not scrambling for money. They, they know how they're going to pay their mortgage. Um, then you start hitting these sort of higher, yeah unhappiness Maslow's. for other reasons right kind yeah of. like uh, i just feel kind of like unfulfilled it's like all right we can and those are the kinds of things i'm i'm encountering more and more as the you know as folks actually get up the you know like oh i'm making twice as much money as i was now, now i have new problems right. right so that that's kind of where i'm at now so especially seth has been really great uh for that sort of stuff yeah so that that's my main probably my main uh, inspiration right now. Zone. Well, I'll point to you one person if you if you want a former Marine ultra marathoner. David Goggins is quite yeah. inspirational, but he'll definitely he's the uh, the drill sergeant that'll yell yeah. in your ear. But his book is absolutely uh, it's just fascinating. I mean, his childhood was brutal, yeah. and then to be able to achieve what he's achieved despite that is quite. It'll leave you going. You know, I can probably put in a little bit more effort. <laughs> myself and you know people around me you know and i just found his story to be very compelling so yeah um, I've, I've heard him interviewed but i haven't read the book yet i'll put that on the list the book's really good and in the book uh he actually took a podcast style of they read through the chapter and then the reader uh interviews him and so there's just you know they go through each chapter and like what were you thinking and like <laughs> when you broke your legs and you were blah, 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 it just, and then he just goes into it and talks about what he was going through in that moment. And it is absolutely uh, 
fascinating story. So if there's mm. anybody into that, it is, there's some harsh language in that. So <laughs> yeah, he's, from the Midwest and you know, no maybe not the book for you, but I don't know. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much. That hey. just flew by. I really appreciate this. Thanks so much hey, uh, for, for sharing. And again, uh, for your show, where if somebody's interested in these sort of the, the value-based pricing concepts and those things, where should they go? Yeah, the best one, the best place to go for that is uh, I have a free email course that we can that drills into individual topics across the course of about a week. Uh, so you can just go to jonathanstark.com and uh, sign up there. You know, you can go to go to that. Um, and if you're into listening to podcasts and you're interested in value pricing specifically, I'd recommend Ditching Hourly. Uh, the business of authority is more about more about mm, with this other sort of life stuff like like you're not really really worried about money as much anymore now you're worried about how do i have a bigger impact on the world how do i get my ideas out and so that they'll spread and actually help other people so it's a little bit bigger picture the ditching hour is a little bit more tactical uh, more around pricing so either one of those you can check out yeah well thank you again jonathan this has been great it was really nice to meet you yeah you too. Uh, that's another reason to have a podcast right <laughs> to totally to people you admire so thank you really appreciate this my pleasure thanks for the invite take, take care all right and take care everybody thank you for listening and for sharing and spreading it around um uh, catch you on the other side bye-bye all right thank you sure we're that worked that went great that was perfect Awesome. Um, I know that's probably out of the zone on the nonprofit side, but I think you hit it just just fine. Oh, I just, good. I don't want to share the concepts, and I do know that there are like these roles of these executive these executive directors and presidents. They don't. They're not in there forever. Um, mm -hmm. They occasionally jump out, and then there's a two year slog, especially as they get older, to find the next seat that's opening up. In the meantime, they're <laughs> They can run around trying to be consultants yeah, and like, yeah, you yeah. should give options and you should not price by the hour. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that will draw some, some interest your way. Sure. Um, yeah. That'd be great. Thanks, Jonathan. I'd love to do this sometime again. Let me hone in on another topic, maybe down the road and see if we can do this one again. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I'd love to. All right. Take care. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Thank you. For more episodes of through the noise, go to through the noise.us.